Baroque is all about pain, and this is what my first run looked like. Everything started out normally enough, a short, cryptic opening cutscene played, and then I was dropped into an abandoned town with a giant bulbous tower looming in the distance, just another day at the office. As I headed toward the tower, an angel appeared, dropped a rifle on the ground, and told me to use it. There's significance in you using it, he said. Then he peaced out. Like I said, just another day at the office. After picking up the rifle, I headed into the tower. I had no weapons, armor, or items, aside from the rifle, but something told me not to use it yet. So I punched some fish, punched some bugs, found a sword and a coat, picked up some bones. I found out most bones don't display their effects until I either gnawed on them or threw them. Some buffed me. Some gave me status ailments. Some damaged enemies. Some made enemies invincible. With certain enemies, I could successfully evade their attacks by strafing. With others, I couldn't. One enemy turned around, farted in my face, and blinded me. Another one stole the armor I was wearing and ran away. Some traps I threw down damaged enemies or gave them status effects. Others gave me status effects. And then, as my health and vitality dwindled and I was madly turning corners trying to find the portal that would take me down to the next floor, which I hoped would be the last, I was surrounded, stunlocked, and beaten to death, only to end up back where I started, in the abandoned town, with my stats reset to level 1 and all of my weapons and items gone. And I hated it. I hated its intentional ambiguity, its difficulty, the merciless way it stripped me of all my progress and left me back at the beginning with nothing. I hated everything about Baroque. But I kept playing. Baroque is a first-person, roguelike, dungeon-crawling action RPG developed by Sting Entertainment, originally released for Sega Saturn on May 21st, 1998. It was then tweaked, enhanced, or ruined, depending on your perspective, and released on the Sony PlayStation with a new subtitle, Uganda Mosul, Distorted Delusion, on October 28th, 1999. It was then remade for the PlayStation 2 with an entirely new art style and third-person perspective, and this version was released on June 28th, 2007, followed by a port to Nintendo Wii on March 13th, 2008. Both the PS2 and Wii remakes got North American and European releases in 2008, but the original Saturn and PlayStation versions stayed in Japan. Even in 2020, when a Nintendo Switch port of the Saturn version became available to download, this also stayed exclusive to Japan. For some reason, it doesn't seem like the powers that be want Western players to experience the original versions of Baroque. However, thanks to the efforts of Pliskin, a fan translation of the PlayStation version was released in 2022. This was followed by a translation of the Saturn version version, also by Pliskin, in 2023. This video is focused on the original versions of the game, specifically the Saturn version since it was the first release, and many fans consider it to be the best version of the game. I also just like to promote the Saturn any chance I get. I did play a bit of the PS1 version, and though it may appear similar to the Saturn release, there are several key differences, which I'll get into later. I did not play the PS2 or Wii remakes. Well, I mean, I tried them out to get footage for this part of the video specifically, but I don't care for the art style and other aspects of the presentation. I know for a lot of you this is how you first experience the game, so you might have some attachment to it, and I get that, but yeah, it's just not as interesting to me as the originals. There's a darkness to the visuals of the original game, especially on the Saturn, where the reds and blacks of the environments and backgrounds just seem to pop more. The sprites for the NPCs and enemies have a darker, more sinister style to them that just fits the overall tone of the game better than the more early 2000s kind of generic anime approach that the remakes went with. The sound design is also much more atmospheric and creepy in the Saturn and PlayStation versions. There are all kinds of weird noises happening in the background. It's sometimes hard to discern whether there's an enemy nearby or the background soundscape is just playing tricks on you. The music, too, is more foreboding in the originals. The PS2 and Wii versions go for dark, techno tracks during cutscenes and exploration, which aren't bad at all. But I prefer the more ambient, atmospheric cuts in the originals.
No matter which version you choose to play though, Baroque is a bewildering experience for first timers. Its narrative is perplexing, its characters and world are just bizarre and unfamiliar. It's hard to find a comfortable foothold with any aspect of it. Baroque's core gameplay mechanics are deceptively simple, but they're buried under layers of intentional complexity. There's also the RNG to contend with. This is a roguelike after all. But like any well-designed roguelike, the more you play, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the more you can begin to develop strategies for surviving and making it to the bottom of the tower so you can shoot God in the face. Baroque is a Japanese game from the 90s, so of course murdering a deity is the end goal. Or is it? Baroque takes place after a world-ending event referred to as the Great Heat Wave in the Saturn fan translation. This disaster brought the world to the current post-apocalyptic state that it's now in and also distorted many of the survivors. You play as a member of a religious organization known as the Order of Malhut, and I don't know Hebrew, so I'm doing my best here with the Sephira. So sometime before the Great Heat Wave, the Order of Malhut, who weren't quite the Order yet, but we'll get to that. Anyway, they discovered God in its physical form. And to protect it and learn more about it, they built the Nerve Tower, named so because it's wired directly into this divine creature. Because of their meddling, though, the world began to distort. Creatures called grotesques began to appear. Civilization was quickly falling apart. Then the Great Heat Wave happened. The leader of the Order of Malhut, the Archangel, whom we meet just outside the Nerve Tower, blames you for this catastrophe. To end this distorted hell of a world, he tasks you with traveling to the bottom of the Nerve Tower and destroying God with the angelic rifle he's developed. Baroque is an intentionally perplexing game, both in its gameplay mechanics and its story. So I think this goes without saying, but for those who have any interest at all in playing it for themselves, spoilers for pretty much the rest of the video. If you manage to make it all the way down to the bottom layer of the tower to face God, you'll quickly find out that these opening eight floors were just a simulation, a training exercise to find out if you were up to the task of shooting God in the face. Whether you succeed or die on one of the floors on your way down, you'll be treated to another cryptic cutscene with off-screen characters speaking a load of sci-fi jargon that you won't understand. The specifics change slightly depending on whether you died or finished the dungeon, but that doesn't really matter here in the beginning. You're apparently a failure that they consider terminating, like the others, but ultimately they decide to let you continue, hoping that remnants of the simulation and implanted memories don't get in the way of you performing your task and atoning for your sin. Then you're back in the outer world, only this time the town is populated by strange beings like Neck Thing, Sack Thing, and The Horned Woman. I didn't just make up generic descriptors to identify these NPCs either. These are the names that appear on screen when you speak to them. Each of these characters has been distorted by the initial capture of God and the great heat wave that occurred after, and each of them holds on to some guilt from their past that weighs on them. As you go through the game, they'll reveal more about themselves and the world to you. You may also run into other NPCs in the tower itself who may be connected to some of the ones on the surface, like members of a group known as the Coriel who are trapped inside confinement caskets and just want to die. Box Thing, who is actually Sack Thing's father, he believes that he murdered her and that she exists inside the box he holds. Urim and Thumim, who originally were two separate characters that merged together during the Great Heat Wave, and a few others. Also out here, you'll find the Sentry Angel, who guards the entrance to the research lab, as well as Coffin Man, a guy who's building a training dungeon, goddammit. A character you won't find in the Saturn version is Thing Thing, unfortunately, and we'll talk about his function later on. Back to that training dungeon though, going through it allows you to gain a few levels and items before heading into the nerve tower for real. Coffin Man will also give you some tips on certain mechanics in the game, goddammit. So let's jump into those. First off, whether in the training dungeon or the nerve tower, your goal on each floor is to find the portal that will send you down to the next floor. Each floor is procedurally generated, but as you descend, certain floor numbers will always contain certain NPCs or events. You also have access to a handy auto map that can be brought up at any time by pressing the B button. Before we get to the specifics of progression though, let's look at some of the core mechanics of the game. You have hit points and vitality at the top left of the screen. 
Vitality constantly depletes, but while you have vitality, your HP regenerates. You run out of vitality and your HP begins to deplete. When that drops to zero, you're dead. Your run is over and you start back in the outer world with your experience reset and all your items gone. Helpfully, most enemies drop crystals that restore a few points of vitality when collected. Health and vitality can be restored by eating flesh either found lying around the tower or dropped from enemies. Different types heal different amounts, but flesh can go rotten, so you either use it or lose it. I haven't quite figured out exactly how long it takes for flesh to go rotten. It might even be another RNG factor, but it's usually good for several floors. If you are put in a position where you need to eat rotten flesh, you'll still be healed, but you'll also get a stomach ache. This isn't just a no-brainer thing that happens. A stomach ache is a potentially crippling status effect that lowers your attack and defense by one point each each permanently. There are only a few items in the game that can relieve a stomach ache, so just like in real life, you'll need to think carefully before you decide to ingest rotten flesh. There are a few other items besides flesh that also heal you, but it's best to hang on to these when you find them, since they don't go rotten and you can save them for emergencies. If you eat certain flesh types when either your HP or VT is full, your max values will rise. Early parts of runs often involve deciding whether to save your stock of flesh for when you're hurting, or consume them now for the stat boosts. As you kill monsters, you'll gain experience and level up. Leveling up increases your base attack and defense, and also raises your max HP. Your VT, however, will remain the same, so the only way to increase it is through flesh consumption, or augmenting it with equipment and other items. There are only three equipable items in the game, swords, coats, and imitation wings. Swords are the only weapon type. Well, except for the Angelic Rifle. That thing one-shots every enemy in the game, but it only carries five shots total. And maybe it's best not to shoot it at all. You have your fists, too, which is what you'll start with on your dungeon runs until you find a sword. I found out that you're not always guaranteed to find a sword on the beginning floors of the tower, either, so your fists might end up being the only option for a bit. Swords come in many flavors. Some have elemental attacks, some hit twice, some hit really hard but drain your health with each swing, etc. Coats are your only armor type in the game. Much like swords, they have a chance to provide a variety of bonuses beyond just increasing your defense. Imitation wings are your accessory items. They grant stat boosts and other effects while wearing them, such as increasing health regeneration, decreasing vitality drain, boosting experience from defeated enemies, protection from status effects, and so on. Your character can be further augmented with brands and parasites. Brands can be applied to your weapon, your coat, and you can even brand yourself. You can only have one brand on a sword, coat, or yourself at any time though, and they can't be removed unless you find an erasure brand or die, of course. One of the most useful brands I found is Wave, which, when branded on either your sword or yourself, grants a chance to release an energy projectile when you swing, allowing you to attack distant enemies or attack through enemies when they're lined up just right. If your sword has an elemental affinity, the Wave attack will also have that affinity when it connects. Having Wave is incredibly useful for some of the late game enemies that can easily shred through your health or derail your run with crippling status effects. Worms infest the character and can also provide various bonuses or boosts. You can also only have one worm infecting you at a time. If you use another, the first one will die and become a corpse in your inventory. Other items you'll find in the tower include injections that provide healing, permanent stat boosts, and other effects, boxes which contain equipment or other items but have a chance to explode when being opened, torturers which act sort of like magic spells, using them will hit all enemies in a room with an effect, but they can also do other things, like bring all the enemies on the floor into the room you're currently in, clear out half the grotesques in a room, or turn them into rotten meat. Getting creative and using multiple torturers, one after the other, to combine effects can really make your life easier in some situations. Patterns, which are like traps, they can be installed and stepped on yourself to affect enemies, or reversed so they can be thrown out for enemies to step on and hit themselves with whatever effect they have. Figuring that out provided some of the more frustrating moments of my early runs. Finally, there are bones, which can be gnawed on or thrown at enemies. Bones can provide both positive and negative effects. Some increase experience gained for a short time. Some grant invincibility for a short time. Some teleport you. Many cause status ailments. A lot of the time, bones and other items won't be identified. You can either roll the dice and try them out to see what they do, or wait until you find an ID parasite or identification bone to reveal their hidden effects. This brings me to one of the most important mechanics of the game. 
throwing. Every item in your inventory can be thrown, and throwing items at enemies to cause damage or inflict status ailments is going to be a huge part of your strategy. Enemies are susceptible to the same status effects as you, even the positive ones, like invincibility. Also, items that heal status effects for you cause status effects for enemies. So, while a detox injection will cure you of poison, it will inflict poison on any enemy it's thrown at. I can't overstate how essential throwing is in Baroque. Not only for doing damage and crippling enemies with status ailments, but also for clearing your inventory. You can only hold up to 20 items at a time. Certain items, like bones, can be stacked, so be sure to press the Y button every once in a while on the inventory screen to organize your stock. They don't stack automatically. But yeah, 20 items is not a lot, because there are items lying around everywhere. And there are so many risk versus reward scenarios in every single run because of inventory management. Do you take the chance and see what that unidentified parasite in your inventory does to you? Because your inventory is full and there's another brand on the ground you could pick up if you use that parasite? Or do you just drop it or toss it away? Or throw it at an enemy, see what it does to them? Or just leave this new item and move on? So many decisions like this need to be made, and you don't have a ton of time to contemplate because your vitality is constantly ticking down. You need to keep moving forward. I mean, you could pause the game or open the menu to give yourself more time to think about it, but you know what I mean. You're on a ticking clock. Every step you take deeper into the tower and every decision you make along the way is part of a chain of either positive or negative events for you. You might be on a super lucky run only to get derailed by one poor choice, or you could be at the end of your rope, sure that the next enemy encounter means death, only to be handed a literal box of hope that fully restores your HP and VT and heals all negative status effects. You just never know. This is the essence of roguelikes, and probably one of the biggest elements that make them so appealing to so many players. That moment-to-moment -moment risk versus reward decision-making and edge-of-your-seat dice rolls. Praise be unto R and Jesus. And Baroque excels at this. But then, of course, there's the element that will drive away most players, and that's the punishment of death. Losing all of your progress in the tower, along with all the items you collected and the experience you gained. Now, losing progress, well... You gain the knowledge of the enemies and what each floor is going to throw at you. Losing items, well, that's just how it is. There are tons of items to collect. You never know what the game is going to throw your way. But losing my level ups and stat gains, that was a tough pill to swallow at first. I haven't played too many roguelikes that feature an experience-based level up system. So when I died and started back at level one, I just thought, what's the point of even doing this? At first. As I started to get used to item management, understand when to boost my health and VT, and when to save healing items, how to effectively deal with most enemies, or just run away from some of the ones that I knew could ruin my run, I then started to realize that being set back to level 1 every time I died wasn't that big of a deal. The tower's not even that long. It expands from 8 floors to 15 after the simulation. Some things change. Like when you first enter, this tiny little creature comes flying towards you, screaming about how it's in pain. Okay. There are some new NPCs who weren't in the simulation who say some weird stuff, and I don't really know what they're talking about, but all I've got to do is make it through 15 floors. I even found out about the sense spheres. These weird living sphere things that can send items back up to the surface. So if you're nearing the end of a run and want that powerful sword that you've boosted the attack of like three or four times that does fire damage and has wave branded into it, you can just toss it in a sphere to grab on the surface and start with next time. You can only throw one item into a sense sphere at a time, but there are several on the penultimate floor of the tower, so you've got ample opportunity to toss your weapon, your coat, and a pair of imitation wings you're partial to. This is also where the extra NPC in the outer world of the PlayStation version thing thing comes into play. In the Saturn version, the items you throw into the sense spheres are just left on the ground on the path to the tower for you to grab. If you don't pick them up before entering though, they'll be gone forever. In the PlayStation version, thing thing holds onto your items. You need to punch him to get him to cough them up, which is his kink and I ain't gonna shame him for it, but yeah, as long as he's holding them, they won't disappear. The amount of items he holds can also be upgraded throughout the game. But anyway, holding onto items, what's even the purpose at this point, you know? This is the end. I died several times trying to make it this far and had to start over, clawing my way back down to this point. But overall, this was a pretty good game. I went from not really being down with a roguelike with experience and level-based stats to actually enjoying myself, reveling in the dice rolls, throwing my hands up to R and Jesus in defeat or praise. I've cleared this penultimate floor of enemies, found the real archangel pierced on some weird spiky orb thing that 
Turns out to be another sense sphere, actually. And that was just his projection on the surface who gave us the rifle before we entered. But uh, yeah, all that's left is to touch the sense orb he's impaled on and head down to the bottom layer. I suppose the game will just let you keep playing after the ending. It's all procedurally generated, so if you enjoy it, you can just keep playing. That's nice of the developers, allowing you to do that. And here we are, the bottom of the tower. This god looks different than the one in the simulation. No longer a projection, now the real thing. The image of a woman crucified in this wireframe prison. It warns me to stay back. I have no past to preserve myself. It has no pain to preserve itself. If I come any closer, I'll go mad. No problem. I equip the angelic rifle and fire the shot. The one shot. The only one that's needed. I wanted to become one with you once again. Huh. One more chance. That doesn't seem like an ending. Wait a minute. Wasn't there an NPC early on? The dialogue was garbled and parts were cut out, but it seemed to be saying not to use the rifle. And that woman on BF-12, the one I followed through the illusory wall, she wanted me to bring her pure water. What was up with that? Oh my god. It's not over. There's more. There's so much more. This son of a bitch is lying. Well, not really. I mean, he believes what he's saying, but his way is not the way to end this. The Archangel wants the god of creation and preservation dead, because he believes that killing her and collecting the orb she leaves behind will allow him to return the world to its former, non-distorted shape. Unfortunately, he's left impaled on a sense sphere, unable to move, so he uses the main character to carry out his plan. However, from the cutscene that plays after you choose to follow his orders, it's clear the main character has different ideas. At this point, you're probably still just a little bit confused about what is actually happening in the story of Baroque, and why it's even called Baroque. There's some information you can glean in the game by talking to NPCs and viewing certain cutscenes, but the triggers for many of these events are difficult to figure out, the dialogue in particular. In fact, the PlayStation version has a scene list that keeps track of every single line from every NPC, and apparently filling out this list completely is one of Baroque's biggest challenges. Certain events need to be triggered in certain orders, and it can take dozens of runs through the game to get everything. And even then, you might not get all the lines to unlock. The criteria for certain dialogue can be really weird. For example, there's a status effect called Lust. When enemies are inflicted with it, they'll stop attacking and just follow you around, leaving you free to attack them without retribution. If you are inflicted with Lust, though, all enemies and items turn into beautiful women. To trigger a couple of the dialogues with some of the women characters, the main character needs to be aroused when speaking to them. There's even one line that's permanently missable from the PS1 exclusive character Thing Thing. It involves not speaking to him for your first three runs of the tower. Kind of annoying to do since he stores the items that you throw into sense spheres in the tower. Still, you could consider your first three runs a wash and attempt this. But if you mess it up, you have to delete your entire save file and start over from the beginning, since Baroque has a system data file that keeps track of all these triggers. Brutal. 
And even so, a lot of these lines of dialogue amount to little more than filler or flavor text. As I mentioned, there are lore moments here and there, but to figure out the bulk of the backstory, you're going to have to dive into Baroque's Japanese-only guidebooks. Yes, books. There are multiple books, as well as interviews with the creators. In the PS2 and Wii remakes, there's a character in the Outer World named the Baroque Monger, who will give you lore descriptions when you show him certain items. He doesn't reveal everything about what's going on, though, and this character doesn't exist in the original versions of the game. Also, the remakes change some of the story details. Certain characters have different motivations, and some relationships between characters aren't the same as they are in the Saturn and PS1 versions. For those who've played the remakes, keep that in mind during this next part of the video, though I'm sure there are still going to be people in the comments chastising me for getting stuff wrong and referring to plot details that only exist in the remake. Just mark right here, right now, I tried my best to give a warning. The story of Baroque is very weird and complex, but it's not that confusing once you put it all together. It's just difficult to actually do that, and its details depend on which version of the game you're playing. Luckily, there's a fan site called The Nerve Tower, which is an incredibly comprehensive resource to both the Saturn and PS1 versions of Baroque. It's insane how much information is collected there, and how detailed it all is. Truly a passion project from its curators. Also on this site is a chronology of events leading up to the beginning of the game. I'll give a condensed version here, but all credit for this information goes to the person, or people, who run The Nerve Tower website website. In the timeline of Baroque, at the end of the 2020s, scientists discovered a previously unknown life form on Earth and formed a think tank organization called Coriel to study this new finding. The Coriel learned that these creatures could take in matter and spit it back out. At first, they didn't understand the purpose of this, but after further study, the Coriel found that the world has always been full of anomalies and distortions. Humans just couldn't perceive them, but these creatures could, and their purpose seemed to be correcting these distortions. The new life forms were named sense spheres, and by tracing their origin, the Coriel soon found out that the sense spheres were part of a larger organism. They pinpointed this entity's location to a spot in the Pacific Ocean near the coast of Japan. The Coriel then started a joint venture with the Japanese government and other corporations. They built a man-made island over the spot where they believed this larger organism was located and started drilling. Deep under the ocean floor, they found what they were looking for and also determined that this organism had in fact created the entire universe. Human beings had finally found physical proof of God's existence. However, they couldn't communicate with it, so the joint venture put together a research team to develop their own artificial sense spheres, hoping to send information through them as a way of talking with God. One of the lead researchers on this team was named Tenjo Kyushiro. When he attempted to use an artificial sense sphere to speak with God, the experience caused him to go insane. For some reason though, the rest of the research team just didn't notice. I don't know, maybe he was just always kind of a weirdo. Anyway, after his failed communication with God, he got it in his head that by destroying God, he could create a new world in his own image, where there would be no hardships or suffering, a world free from pain. To get people on board with his new plan, though, he recorded the voice of God that he had heard and that had driven him insane into an audio file that he called the Tarantella Melody. Tarantella being a set of Italian folk dances. I don't know. Then he made others listen to it, which caused them to also go insane. After he'd driven all the members of the government, the corporations, and the Coriel mad with the Tarantella melody, he seized control, started referring to himself as the Archangel, and changed the name of the joint venture organization to the Order of Malhut. They also started wearing imitation wings because they saw themselves as angels. I don't know, they were all nuts, you know. Apparently, the Archangel also had an interest in tarot cards, and he made a special deck with each card containing information about how he wanted the world to be changed. And then he put those custom tarot cards into the artificial sense spheres in the hopes that this would change the way that God went about correcting the distortions of the world, shaping it more in the Archangel's image of how things should be. Again, he was off his rocker. The Swiss make the best watches, because they have all the cheese. But yeah, God kind of saw through the Archangel's plan here and started making more sense spheres to counter all the corrupted data it was receiving from the Archangel's tarot shenanigans. But the artificial sense spheres were still going out into the world where they were driving new people crazy. The normal public started using the term Baroque to refer to the people who went mad from the artificial sense spheres' influence. Baroque is also used in-game to describe delusions, so the people who went Baroque, as it were, had lost the ability to suppress their delusions. 
delusions. Now, Baroque is most commonly used to refer to the ornate style of music, art, and architecture that was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries. But the word Baroque is from the French and literally means irregularly shaped. So for some weird Japanese-English reason, in the world of Baroque, people started using the literal definition of the word to describe these crazy people. Personally, I think the writers on the production staff were just picking foreign words out of a hat here. At the same time all of this was happening, the Archangel started sending out copies of the Tarantella melody so he could recruit new members for the Order of Malhut. But a lot of the people who listened to God's voice through the Tarantella melody actually wanted to protect God for some reason. So the Archangel had to find a way to turn them over to his plan of destroying God. To do this, he convinced people that by correcting distortions, God was actually trying to destroy the world. With his followers united in his cause, he now needed to figure out how to get rid of God's ability to detect the corrupted data he was trying to feed into it. Through research, which seems to be wielded as magic in this story, the Archangel found out that God could actually feel pain. Just like humans experience pain as a result of injury or a warning of danger, so did God. So the Archangel just needed to take away God's pain receptors. Then he could finally destroy God. Two researchers in the order were selected to develop a way of extracting God's pain-inducing chemicals. These researchers would eventually become the NPC's neck thing, and another NPC we haven't talked about yet, the Guardian Angel. Though at this time, they were still just ordinary people who were crazy and wore fake angel wings. But besides that, they were completely normal. Anyway, they figured out how to extract God's pain somehow, which ended up birthing a new creature they called the Littles. These are the things that you see screaming at you every time you enter the tower on the first floor, distilled life forms that represented God's pain. The Archangel harvested these Littles and used them as ammunition in a rifle he developed. Any creature that was shot with this rifle would then feel the full weight of God's pain and be completely obliterated. The Archangel figured if God was shot with a rifle, it could finally be destroyed. Just a tiny problem here though. Because God had lost its ability to feel pain, it couldn't detect not just the artificial distortions the angel was trying to feed it, but it also couldn't detect the real distortions anymore. So now the world was beginning to distort out of control. Remember the Archangel's tarot deck plan? Well, that was getting all mixed up in things, and now the Baroque people who were going nuts were trying to be corrected by the sense spheres, but they just ended up mutating and transforming into what people started calling grotesques. So the enemies you fight in the Nerve Tower were originally people. Each is a representation of a tarot card and a corrupted version of the Archangel's plans to change the world in his image. So there's that. But then the Archangel had an even bigger problem when one of the new recruits to the Order went inside the Nerve Tower and played the Tarantella melody. Some members of the Coriel, the original think tank group of the joint venture before they all became the Order of Malhut, were inside the tower at the time. And after hearing the melody again, they snapped out of their delusions and realized the Archangel was just a crazy asshole. So they came up with a plan they called the Devar Fusion. Devar is another Hebrew word that means speech, talk, word, promise, and a bunch of other similar meanings. Anyway, the Coriel planned to have one of their own fuse with God, so that God could inherit the ability to speak with humans. They chose the twelfth Coriel, who had been born as a conjoined twin, one heart between two bodies. When this member was just a child, doctors came to the conclusion that one of the twins would have to die for the other to live. Number twelve didn't get to make this decision for himself, since he was still a child when the operation happened, but his brother died so he could live. Or at least, that's how he perceived his own past. The whole twin thing could have just been part of the madness that listening to the Tarantella melody caused in him, maybe still left unreversed even after listening to it again and breaking free of the Archangel's control. Either way, the survivor's guilt that Number 12 felt was very real, though the other Coriel didn't know about this. They just thought he was a good choice for the fusion since he had already lost half his body. Again, I don't know, I guess that's some kind of logic. The Coriel carried out their plan, but the Archangel caught wind of it, and while Number 12 was in the middle of fusing with God, he physically pulled them apart. This created an intense wave of pain throughout all the sense spheres. Though their bodies hadn't finished fusing, Number 12 and God's minds had. This created a huge distortion, which was later called the Great Heat Wave, and it destroyed most of the world. People and grotesques alike were fused together from the heat, and others were further mutated. 
During this intense event, the Archangel himself ended up impaled on a sense sphere, which left him immobile, but he could still communicate with the outside world through the sense sphere. He told the rest of the Order to capture Number 12 and conduct research on him to figure out what had happened. God had taken away Number 12's voice, which now allowed God to communicate with humans, and it left Number 12 with the ability to purify distortions. Whenever Number 12 killed something, it would turn into a crystal containing the purified essence of that person or creature. These are the crystals we've been collecting this whole time. They're referred to in-game as Idea Sephira. Now the Archangel had a new plan. Clone number 12 with his purification ability and have him purify God. Through cloning, he could change number 12's memories, erasing the Devar fusion, but keeping the survivor's guilt he felt. I guess the Archangel left a little too much of number 12's rebellious nature though, because when he does purify God, he decides not to follow the Archangel's plan and gives the world another chance. And this is where we pick up. And, uh, yeah, after finishing this section, I realized that backstory was not all that condensed after all. But if you want an even more detailed write-up about the events leading up to the beginning of Baroque, including footnotes referencing specific NPC dialogue, guidebook information, and creator interviews, check out the Nerve Tower site. There's a link in the description below. But anyway, it's time to head back to the tower. The Archangel will still give you the Angelic Rifle, even though we're not down with his plan, but we're just another clone, so maybe he's hoping this one will obey. Also, because I stupidly thought shooting God would end the game, I did not use the sense spheres to send any of my items back to the surface. So that awesome fire sword with the wave ability? Gone. I cursed the game for quite a while during my next run of the tower for that one. I mean, I should have known, but I was just excited to have reached the end. I was running low on VT by the time I got to the Archangel. Totally depleted, actually. So I, I don't know, I just, I just wasn't thinking. Anyway, there are two things that need to happen on this run through the tower. One, on BF12, you need to find the NPC Eliza and follow her through the illusory wall. You can meet her briefly on BF2, but meeting her on BF12 specifically is where the first trigger is. She tells you that she wants you to bring her pure water before fading away. The second thing you have to do is, when you reach the bottom layer and confront God again, instead of shooting her, you need to walk towards her to attempt the Devar fusion once more. Well, that didn't work. So, we're back in the outer world. And, full disclosure, at this point I'd managed to bumble my way into attempting the fusion with God. Clearly the gun didn't work and God tells you to stay back or you'll go mad if you get close. So that seemed like a clear indication that that was what I was actually supposed to do. From here on out though, the steps you need to take to achieve the true ending in Baroque are pretty abstract, as if they weren't already. They're not abstract if you know all the details of the backstory that I just explained, but only some of that information is actually in-game, and those pieces are again buried under dialogue and cutscene triggers that depend on a lot of different variables. All of this to say that I ended up using the guide on the Nerve Tower website to figure out how to get the true ending. But even with the guide, you still need to make it to the bottom of the tower, which expands from 15 floors to 23 once you've completed the right steps. And 23 is just for the Saturn. The PlayStation version adds more floors, and the remakes add even more. Once again, there are two goals we need to accomplish. In the last ending, when we attempted the Devar fusion again, there was a cryptic bit of dialogue from God. She said, You have no past to preserve yourself. I have no pain to preserve myself. Don't come any closer. 
any further and you will go mad. We saw what happened when we approached God in this state. The main character was still racked with survivor's guilt over the supposed death of his twin brother. For the Devar fusion to be successful, we need to restore the main character's past and restore God's ability to feel pain that was taken away by the Archangel's interference. As I've mentioned though, the steps to achieve both of these things are a bit more complicated than our two goals from the previous tower run. So first things first, let's go check on those weirdo NPCs outside. Well, this is new. Neck Thing has buried himself in soil, crushed under the weight of his guilt at extracting the pain from God and causing this predicament everyone is in. He claims he has no right to continue living in this world, but perhaps he can find peace if he burrows into the ground. He also mentions he's hungry and wants a heart seed. This is just a higher level vitality healing item. You've most likely already run across several in the tower at this point. Now, you can run through the tower, find a heart seed, throw it in a sense sphere, then either die or complete the tower, so that when you start again in the outer world, you can grab the heart seed and give it to him. Doing this will have Neck Thing turning into a flower that will sprout heart seeds. He'll do this for a few rounds of tower runs before finally turning into just a crystal, his idea Sephira. Anyway, we need Neck Thing's idea Sephira to advance the story. But fulfilling his request for a heart seed takes a long time. So instead of doing that, if you have no heart of your own, you can just kill him right then and there. Which is what I did. Showing the crystal to the other NPCs allows them to understand Neck Thing's desires. The point everyone gets out of this is to bury themselves to be free from pain. The sentry angel guarding the entrance to the research lab is especially intrigued by Neck Thing's crystal. After you hand it over to him, you can then head into the tower again or just go through the training dungeon. When you emerge, you'll find that everyone has buried themselves in the ground, even sentry angel. Though things don't seem to be going so smoothly for him. You okay, buddy? But hey, the way into the research lab is open now. Inside, you're confronted by a worker who doesn't understand why you've returned to the lab. You're then locked in with your own clones. They ask you to purify them. Doing so has them all disappearing, and this leaves behind a projection of yourself who gives you what it calls pure water, which is the main character's own idea, Sephira. Touching it sends you through the sense sphere, where the main character has a dialogue with himself while the lab workers wonder how you managed to escape and what will happen to the Archangel's plan now. So remember how Eliza was asking for pure water when we met her last time? Now it's time to enter the tower again and hand over our idea Sephira to her. On BF2, we find Eliza through the illusory wall where she explains that she wants to use the water to birth a sense sphere and restore her insane mother. Hand it over and she'll thank you, then tell you to meet her again further down the tower. There's something else we'll need to do before we see Eliza again though. On BF10, we can enter the Guardian Angel's chamber. Inside, you'll meet the Guardian Angel, watching over a sense sphere. This is the other researcher who helped Neck Thing extract God's pain. This was also the character who appeared in the simulation, and sort of told us not to use the rifle. Meeting her here will trigger a cutscene where you'll see the meeting between the Archangel and Guardian, where he tells her to extract the pain from God, creating the Littles. However, the Guardian Angel warns that a team of worker angels are on their way to try to kill the Littles, so the main character needs to get there first and purify them. We've actually been running into some of these worker angels on our journey through the tower. Also, I got attacked by this goddamn enemy while I was talking to the guardian angel, which ruined my understanding of what was going on until I could go back and do a frame by frame through the footage. So yeah, that can happen while talking to NPCs, even during important events. If you haven't fired the angelic rifle yet during this run, which I hope you haven't, you can hand it over to the Guardian, and she'll give you a permanent stat boost item. Next, we need to meet with Eliza on BF12 again. She used the main character's crystal to create a sense sphere, and by interacting with it, he can regain his past. This cryptically explains the decision to kill one of the twins, as well as the Coriel's decision to select number 12 for the Devar fusion. It also relates how Archangel discovered their plan, and ended up encasing all the Coriel in confusion confinement caskets as punishment for their betrayal. I actually missed this second very important meeting with Eliza on two separate runs through the tower and couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting down to the lower floors and just kept facing God again after BF13. I finally remembered that Eliza said to meet her again in the tower's depths, and this event causes the tower to divert beyond this point, so you can proceed further down. Luckily, once you've completed an event, 
it's always complete. You don't have to redo the research lab or handing over the pure water to Eliza. So if you end up missing an event like I did or die on your way through the tower, you can just keep going until you reach the next event floor. Anyway, after speaking with Eliza again, continue down to BF15. Here you'll find an area where the littles are kept. They ask you to purify them, and when you do, you'll receive their crystal. If, however, you've used the angelic rifle during the current run, they won't let you enter. So you'll have to either die or complete the tower to start over again without firing the rifle. Lastly, on the next floor, BF16, we need to speak to Alice. Alice is another character we've been running into along the way. She and Eliza are actually both aspects of God, created as a way to bring about the Devar fusion's success. Eliza's purpose was to help the main character regain his past and Alice's purpose is to help God regain its pain. Give her the Little's Crystal, and this will expand the tower to its final 23-floor configuration. Now you just have to make it to the end. The last five floors are the toughest, and it might take several attempts to make it all the way through, especially if RNG isn't on your side. I had to try like four times before I finally made it down to BF21, where the Archangel now resides, and was able to proceed to the bottom layer and for a final time attempt the Devar fusion.
In the end, it turns out there wasn't actually any way to fix the distorted world. This is its true nature, and the only thing anyone can do is accept it. Hold Baroque inside yourself. So in the beginning, when I said Baroque is all about pain, this is what I was talking about, and any fans watching could probably guess as much, but yeah, the pain is not about its gameplay, although it can be painful coming to grips with some of its systems and mechanics, especially the unidentified items and the cruelty of its RNG. There's definitely some jank. I wish there were more reliable ways to use strafing to avoid damage. They designed some of the enemies in that way, but most others will always just turn to target you with their attacks no matter where you're standing. It also would have been nice if there were just a bit more in the way of hints to help players figure out how to get the true end ending and actually see the end credits. I get it's about playing over and over and fully exploring to find all the NPCs scattered about, but some of these requirements feel like a stretch in logic. Some of that is painful to deal with. But the game's whole story deals with pain. Not feeling it, feeling it not being able to reconcile it, feeling only it. Pain runs the gamut here. Overall though, Baroque is an incredible experience. I started out not knowing what to make of it, hating it in fact, but it slowly began to sink its teeth into me, and it wouldn't let go until I discovered its secrets. And I didn't even talk about all of them in this video. There are plenty of other NPC dialogues and things to uncover about the various characters. The PlayStation version, along with the scene list, includes a 200 floor hell dungeon that you can tackle after you complete the game. This is what Coffin Man was trying to build the entire time you were making runs through the Nerve Tower. There are also several Baroque side games, including a shoot 'em up and a mobile game that's like a Baroque version of Frogger. I mean, if you really can't get enough of the franchise, it's out there. And hey, Sting released the original Saturn version on Switch a few years back, so you never know, they might end up remaking Baroque again for modern platforms in the future. They don't seem to want to let it die. The pain never ends. But unfortunately, this video has to. And that's Baroque. Thank you all so much for watching. Many people have requested this game in the comments and such, and it's what the patrons and YouTube members voted for, so yeah, all these people who are on screen right now, they voted. They support this channel monthly, and if you want to join them, click the Patreon link in the description or hit the join button on this video page for a YouTube membership. You'll get to watch videos a couple of days early, get exclusive updates from me, and vote in occasional polls to decide what games I cover. If you donate $5 a month or more, you get your name read out loud at the end of videos like these Dungeon Architects, Antichrist Alex, Benefer94, David Carr, Goats and Goblins, Glenn Haven, Half HP, High Food Court, Izzy Lexus, Joshua Ayers, Justin Darnell, Captain Ketchup, Kyola, Lunar Vale, Meownarchy, Nick Wolf, Richard Cutting, Shannon Gates, Stefano Urenya, and White Like Eyes as well as these dungeon connoisseurs. Adon, Alberto Amatucci, Alfred Correa, Anjan01, Bunzo, Chaos Arcanum, Charm Slurm, Chiral Spiral, Crassus Zero, Crippler Jones, Dazed Clockwork, Dika Dico, Glitterthroat, Hukun Buyum, Indigo Happy, Irregular Rob, J Butt Airline, Gemma, Jet Daddy, Jogoth Ur, Joshua Weber, Liana, Macrophage, Minced Meat, Mr. Independent, Nicholas Polstar, Noel the Monkey, Normal AI, Old Dead Lemons, Olaf Albine, Please Keep Making Videos, Pretty Cody, Prince Goof, Rainbows 98, Rez, Ribbon Black, Robert Brandon, Sable, Samuel Pandiangan, Samurai 85X, Solar, T, True Axiom, Tuesday Twin, TV's Brent, Warrior Song, Where Am I, Help, and Zach Diedrich. Thank you all for your support, and thank you for watching. The next video, also voted on by the Dungeon Dwellers, is going to be Haunting Ground for PS2. So look forward to that. For now, Baroque. Check it out. Dungeon Chill. Out. <laughs> <laughs>